Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for joining today. Um, just a heads up uh, that we are hiring. Um, I think I know everybody here, um, but we are looking for another research scientist. So if you have a recent graduate or somebody else in mind that would look uh, favorably on time with the IDL, um, let us know. And we're also looking for new students this next semester. So um, yeah, excited to get started. Uh, our main goal is to be a resource to you all. So uh, that's part of why we're here today. And thanks to Andy and Idaho Power for paying for lunch and uh, Marco's time um, for this lecture today. Um, you know, we're not trying to compete with you all in terms of energy modeling or anything like that. Our, our job is to um, teach ourselves out of a job, right? And um, just enhance your own practice and uh, explore different tools like Cove and Open Studio. Um, as an educational resource. And so these are just quick reminders that we have these resources for you. Our energy resource library, um, some new tools this year, ozone uh, measuring. Um, we've got CO2 monitoring, purple air, um, as well as our usual just light temperature, humidity monitoring. Um, anyway, all are free to you to use since you're in Idaho Power Service territory. So just let us know. Our BSUG, lecture is why you're here today. Uh, and then we have a training coming up November 8th uh, on luminaire level lighting controls, which is right upstairs here in our office. We've installed those lights here. You can see the good, the bad, and the ugly of how they work. Dylan can talk you through zoning, wireless controls, all of that. Um, so it's a great resource either for you, for your electricals, um, or facility managers as well. I think it's pretty good. And Dylan, did you want to say anything specific about that? Or? Uh, no, we've already had one, and everyone found it very valuable, uh, both the lecture part and the active portion. Um, so yeah, you get a hands-on experience with uh, this technology. Uh, and then we still have our technical design assistance program. So if you have a question, uh, give us a call. If it's phase one, if it's less than $2,000 worth of our time, which most of these are, it's totally free. There's no paperwork or anything like that. Uh, if it's a little bit more of our time, if it's a basic simulation or more of a, a detailed analysis of something, um, that's when we submit a proposal to Andy or Cherie over at Idaho Power. Uh, they usually give us a, a thumbs up and we go from there. And that's still completely free to you. And then if it's a really detail, uh, a lot of our time up to 4, 000, over $4,000 worth of our time, that's when there's a cost share with the client, but Idaho Power still pays 75% of that. So um, a great program. Um, it gives us a chance to learn about new things, gives you access to university resources, grad student time, um, extra research time on something that you might be interested in, like power over ethernet or um, luminaire level lighting controls or any new technology that you're considering for a building. And from here, I'll let Andy talk about what Idaho Power does. So. Awesome. So hi, everyone. My name is Andy Warren. I'm here with Idaho Power. So we work with IDL on several things, one of them being this B-Side lecture that you're at right now. So we just like to take a little bit of time and just make sure that you guys are aware or remind you that we do have energy efficiency incentive programs. So we have a new construction major renovations program and a retrofits program. Those are both um, menu-based incentive programs. And then we also have a custom projects program if it doesn't fit the menu. Um, new construction major renovations. We have this slide in here really just to make sure that you all are aware as you're working with customers is we do have a professional assistance incentive and it's actually doubled. Um, it doubled about a year ago, year and a half ago. So um, it's a lot better of an incentive now. I know that you all are busy with your projects, but if you take a little bit of time out to help that customer with this, then you can get an incentive for yourself as well. It doesn't take away from the customer's incentive at all. It is completely separate and it goes directly to you, not through the customer. That's, that's it. Yep. All right, well, with that, uh, let me switch over to um, uh, the main feature today. Um, Marco, who is the research director uh, at the Cove Tool. So thank you very much for joining us today, Marco. Um, yeah. As uh, director, uh, Marco coordinates the, the development of basically all new features for this Cove energy modeling tool. Uh, he received his degree in architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, 
a lead green associate since 2019 and BIM expert and building simulation and performance expert. So um, Marco, thanks for your time today. Thanks for introducing us to this tool and uh, feel free to take it away from here. Awesome, yeah, nice to meet everyone. Um, <clears throat> like, uh, I believe that was Dylan talking. Um, like uh, you just mentioned, I am the research director at Tool. If you haven't heard about Tool before, we are a web-based um, building simulation platform. Um, so for today's uh, presentation, I will just go through a slide deck really quick, talking about some of the ways we're helping folks um, create a more efficient workflow, um, some of the things that we're trying to target and challenges that we're looking at in the industry and how we can um, make it easier to win more projects, meet energy codes, uh, reduce design revisions, all that kind of stuff with the simulations. Um, energy modeling is just one of the many features that we have at Cove Tool. So we've ag aggregated a lot of different tools, which we'll be talking about today. Um, but for the second half of the presentation, I'll actually be doing a walkthrough of the platform. So um, hopefully you'll learn something and then see something. And if you're interested, definitely check out our website to learn more information about getting a, a trial or anything like that started. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, if you guys have uh, questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. If you're virtual, if you're in person, um, I'll uh, open up the floor at the end of the session to kind of clarify any of these points, but I'll just go through the presentation really quickly. Um, here's a quick look at the agenda. We'll talk about um, the problems the industry is currently facing, some of the cases for integrating more analysis and sustainability into your design workflow, how we can try to build a collaborative effort, and analysis is really the key to get more folks involved earlier into the project, and then some of the metrics, things you need to know about performance metrics and how to communicate them. Um, after that fourth section, I will kind of uh, pause the PowerPoint presentation and just hop into the tool to talk about the different simulations, tools, how they work, all that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so what are the challenges? Um, there's quite a few different aspects. Um, you know, building a building is really complicated. There's a lot of different things that are happening, but these are um, some of the top four things that we typically that are typically mentioned when folks are looking at Cove Tool. Um, starting at most projects are going over budget. There's a lot of uh, inefficiency built in through the constant design revisions that we have in projects. Um, energy codes are getting more stringent every year, so it's harder to meet the minimum requirements and it's requiring new understanding of technologies, building practices, and then uh, catching up to all of the conversation about decarbonization, electrification, that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of firms are also having troubles with winning more projects and improving their profitability. So we'll talk about ways that you can expand that. And then of course, everybody, um, hopefully in this presentation today, and most of the people in our industry, really wanna incorporate more sustainability and design for building comfort or building efficiency, um, but it tends to be the lowest priority um, throughout the project and it's typically something that's value engineered out. So we wanna talk about how do you make it more innate, bigger priority, how do we make a conversation and also be able to generate some of the metrics that help us have those discussions like payback periods, energy savings, um, all those kinds of things. Um, Next, uh, one of the other really interesting um, uh, metrics that I found or statistics that I found from the Technology, Culture, and Future of the Architecture Firm report. This is a survey that's published every year by the AIA. Um, only 33% of architecture firms feel they have reliable data when they make decisions about their project. Um, this is incredibly crucial because there's a lot of different things that architects are responsible for. They're coordinating a lot of different conversations and all the decisions they make have an impact on the building's construction costs, operational costs, the carbon emissions, and all of the other factors that are built into a project. Um, here's a visualization showcasing how quickly energy codes are changing. So this is a graphic uh, showcasing uh, when the energy code established the baseline, which is back in the 2003. That's where most buildings on a national average are currently their minimum energy consumption is at. Um, since then, we saw uh, energy code reductions for 5%, 30%, 50%, which is where most of the country is at right now. And we're, all, we're already having conversations and we have certain states and uh, municipalities around the country that are trying to go for even higher targets like the 2030 challenge 
um, reducing reliance on fossil fuel energy um, or being able to deliver net zero energy, net zero carbon building. Um, of course, if you're not able to do any of these things, if you don't have the understanding of the construction practices of the new technologies that's out there, if you're not working with clients and having conversations about what the investment will look like to build these code minimum buildings, this is how a lot of architects are gonna quickly lose out on a lot of projects. Um, so just being more involved in this conversation will help you kind of, first of all, catch up and then eventually be an industry leader as more of these things become uh, come into law. We're also seeing major authority figures like ASHRAE kind of push for other metrics. So right now we've been seeing things like energy code require or higher energy uh, targets. Um, but we're also seeing things like decarbonization, carbon emissions, and body carbon. A lot of architects don't know how to calculate that, measure that, reduce that. Um, back in 2021, ASHRAE launched the Decarbonization Task Force. Their first mission was just to collect resources for architects and engineers to understand what exactly is emitting all the carbons and what they can do to reduce that. Um, but now we're seeing ASHRAE actually change legislation, write new energy code standards that are going to be uh, coming into law in the next couple of years um, as to what kind of targets we have to meet. Um, things like the energy, uh, the 2030 target also have a lot of different aspects they're touching. Um, there's things like renewables that are becoming required uh, more often, but also looking at system designs, building envelopes, um, lighting strategies, water heating strategies, and then targets all over the world requiring different levels of stringent energy consumption and carbon emissions, and then making sure that you understand what that means for the projects that you're delivering. This is not an issue just for government projects, university projects like those big budget projects, but we're also gonna see this happen with smaller residential multifamily projects, um, which is the highest percentage of projects in the US right now, of new projects in the US right now. Um, one other challenge, of course, getting back to that sustainability conversation is buildings are right now considered over contributors to the climate crisis. About 40% of to total global carbon emissions are coming from buildings. And then half the buildings uh, that will be used in 2050 have already been built. So the buildings that we're designing today, tomorrow, in the next couple of years, we need to make sure that we're able to deliver the highest performance project because that's directly contributing to uh, the climate crisis. So if we can make better decisions about material selection, system designs, all those different factors, the more we can fight uh, global warming and other factors like that. And of course, there's a lot of different things that are coming out of this, like uh, we'll soon see more impacts to the environment, to the economy, to public health, and hopefully if we can reduce emissions that come from buildings, we can have a more positive impact on where we're going to be heading. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of reasons why folks aren't currently doing performance analysis or any type of building simulations. Uh, most folks think that it's incredibly expensive. Um, right now, typically, if you have a sustainability workflow in your design process, you're hiring consultants, but not every project can afford a consultant. Um, performance analysis is also thought to be incredibly complicated. You need to have a degree in it. You need to be an expert that's been doing energy modeling, daylight modeling for the past 10 years. Otherwise, like what can you realistically generate or output? Um, a lot of folks think that performance analysis is necessary because clients aren't asking for it. And we'll talk about that when we break down the business case next. Um, and also that it's very much for just specific types of projects, um, which we've already showcased to, to not be true because we're seeing a lot of changes in legislation and elsewhere as to what kind of projects have to hit what kind of targets and how many aspects of the building that's going to impact. Um, so a little bit more about the business case. Um, right now, the ASC industry is really fragmented. There's a lot of different tools, um, simulations, platforms out there that uh, allow us to do a lot of different types of studies or explore different factors of our building. Um, but you can see just with this graphic below, there's a lot out there and it can be pretty complicated, pretty expensive to get to what it is you're trying to do. Um, and because of this fragmentation, we've seen over $268 billion lost in profits because we're not communicating well enough. We're losing a lot of data as we transfer information from one 
platform to another, communicate with our uh, consultants, our owners, our suppliers, and none of this information is uh, easily translatable from one tool to another. Um, and of course, there's a lot of other factors leading to all of these different losses. And these losses are taken directly out of our own uh, billable hours, our project costs, our overhead costs, and the way we coordinate and work with our collaborators. Um, and I've already talked a little bit about this, but the consultant workflow is also something that's really complicated. We're not, uh, at Koto, we're not trying to replace the consultant workflow, um, but we understand that the consultant workflow is currently really limited. Um, very few projects can afford the consultant. Um, consultant work also takes time before you can actually get the information back that you need to make a decision. So if we can incorporate more analysis in-house earlier on, the bigger the impact we can have. Um, and of course, just being able to communicate with our owners, um, our project teams, as to why sustainability is crucial and not just a luxury. Um, if you don't know, right now, only 50% of projects in the US will ever get energy modeled. And typically the only time they're energy modeled is after the project has been designed. Um, so we're typically doing analysis when it's too late, when we've already made decisions, when we've already uh, specified all the different factors of the building. And this is typically where a lot of design revisions happen and you have to leverage the green features or other kind of design features that you wanted to have in the project and cut the project back to get you back in budget, to help you meet the project targets that you were contracted to meet and all of those other factors. Um, here's a graphic that really showcases what it means to incorporate analysis earlier on. So if you haven't seen it before, this is the McLearning curve. Um, here with this black line on the graph, you can see where typically uh, analysis is currently done. So when we do our first energy model or daylight model, it's laid into DD, into construction document phase. We've already made all the decisions about the project. And if we realize we can't hit our targets or we're over budget, or we're not even delivering a code minimum building, let alone if you had higher performance targets like a certification for lead or anything else, um, this is where most projects go over budget. Um, if we can move analysis earlier on, which is what Cove Tool is trying to do, the more uh, impact we can have on the product's performance and also on its final uh, construction and operational costs. So you can run a simulation and analysis in real time as you're making decisions about massing, orientation, facade design, uh, material selection, specifications, mechanical load sizing, um, et cetera. Those are all tools that we can do um, before we are ready to start the construction document phase. And of course, analysis uh, becomes less useful once we finally design the building. So that's something that people need to know that analysis window is very short and it's very much only at the beginning of a project. A um, little bit more about the business case. So one of the things that we hear often is that clients aren't asking for analysis or performance. Um, that's not entirely true. We conducted a survey of over a thousand architect and engineering firms across North America asking them is, uh, are your owners talking about this? Are they looking for this? And about half of the respondents said that sustainability was something that was mentioned and typically in the RFP. And we have a lot of research as to why that might be. Um, in this graphic, we show what uh, is so attractive to different stakeholders with green buildings. Um, for the tenants, these are the folks who live and work in green buildings. They're the ones who are looking for uh, spaces that are better for their well-being and their health. They can improve their productivity and has lower operational costs. Um, for developers and building investors, uh, they want to make sure that they're protecting their investment, that they can sell for a higher rate. They have lower construction costs, design costs. Um, green buildings tend to sell faster as well. Uh, for building owners, it's all about protecting their portfolio, making sure that they invest in buildings that have lower depreciation, they last longer, they have increased occupancy, as well as all of the intersecting factors between those different stakeholders. Um, also, currently we're seeing a huge shift in firms across the US. This is uh, also from the technology and culture report from the AIA. And it's showcasing that right now, a lot of firms are looking for new technology that can improve their efficiency and also expand their clientele. So folks who are looking to be more profitable, they're trying to 
find new clients. They're looking for client referrals. And they're also looking to invest in digital tools that can improve their marketability, um, how people see the projects that they're delivering and designing. Um, another interesting metric from this report are uh, two of the biggest profitability and efficiency indicators for firms um, that were successful last year um, were the firms who were able to showcase strong project management skills and also showcase real-time insights. I um, mean, again, that's incorporating more analysis and being able to have a collaborative team so more folks know what's happening, when it's happening, and there's a decision-making process uh, built into the design workflow. Um, firms are also looking uh, to expand profitability by offering more services. Um, so there's a lot of different services that can be added to your contracts, like daylight modeling, energy modeling. Um, typically, this was analysis that was conducted by the architect before we started to segment the field into more consultants, engineers, energy modelers, all these different um, smaller siloed areas of analysis. Um, but these are things that you can bring in back into your firm. Um, but it, it really depends on what it is you're trying to do. Um, so uh, last thing I wanna talk about before we hop into the tool is also the collaborative effort. Um, so there's a lot of different people within your project team and we're all kind of working towards the same goal. We wanna make sure that we can meet the, the client's leads, that we're complying to all of the regulations and standards associated with the project's location um, and whatever else is required, and as well as being able to design a cohesive, high performance and safe project. Um, even though we're all working towards the same mission, um, there's a couple of things that are segmented and don't necessarily work well together. Um, first and foremost, design and analysis are typically standalone, so they don't actually, most teams don't use them together. So when you're designing a project, that's one step that one part of the project team is working on, and then analyzing that design is uh, completely separate, and that communication isn't fluid or happening going back and forth. I um, mean, if it is going back and forth, it takes longer to go back and forth. Um, also, new standards are getting more complicated. There's a lot of factors that aren't necessarily working together. That is more of a, um, an authority issue, but it's something that we're currently seeing is causing inefficiencies in all the industries. Um, also, design data is very siloed. So as you're making decisions about whether the, the material, uh, your building products are available for suppliers, um, there's data about the uh, thermal performance of the product that the mechanical engineer is making. Um, there's decisions about the project's cost that the cost estimator is looking at, and none of that information is actually kind of being uh, put into play or combined together, um, or it's a really difficult job that architects are struggling with. Um, and of course, all of this siloing between the different industries and the different process is causing projects to go over budget. Um, so the goal, of course, is to design an integrative team, have more folks be involved earlier on, communicating um, as often as possible. Um, this is what the traditional uh, process looks like, where you have the more saturated blue. This is where, in the life of the project, these folks get involved in. So architect and owner, very beginning of the project all the way to the end. Um, it, isn't, it isn't until design development that we saw other key players like the MEPs, civil consultants, um, other folks uh, being involved. And of course, a lot of the decisions that they could have helped make, uh, we've already missed that window of opportunity. So involving them earlier on um, is gonna be one of those things that can help us achieve all these efficiencies and design a better building. Um, here's really what that process looks like. And we're not necessarily uh, trying to get you to hire them earlier on but just have a platform where the decisions that they could help make, um, if they can join earlier on, they can, or if the architects can also start looking and exploring those different decisions that those uh, different collaborators can make, that's what we're trying to do with Cove Tool. Um, we have a lot of different collaboration features um, with our platform. Of course, you can invite everybody in your project team. They don't have to have their own Cove Tool subscription. Um, they can just log in, see what's happening. Um, we have chat features so you can tag people, upload files, um, go back and forth on what's happening within the project and a lot of different tools and simulations that 
are more focused to different fields and not necessarily everyone has to be involved in. Um, here's what our kind of analysis workflow looks like. Um, of course, you can decide to choose Cove Tool or if you're going to go for another um, performance analysis platform. Um, it's still important that you do figure out exactly how you're going to make this process happen, who's going to be involved, what types of metrics you're going to record, and uh, what kind of targets and benchmarks you want to set um, for your project to achieve. Um, so I'm going to do this section really quick and then uh, I think it will be useful just to set a foundation for understanding the metrics and how they matter and how you should communicate them and then we'll actually see them in the platform. So what is performance analysis? Um, a performance um, simulation, specifically the ones that we're doing in Cove Tool, are computer models that help us iterate, test, analyze, and improve your building design. Um, everything that is happening in Cove Tool is an approximation. We're not trying to exactly predict what the final design is going to be because there's too many variables in place. Um, and that's one of the things that we want to make sure that is communicated as you start incorporating analysis and simulation. Um, everything that we do follows different uh, standards, assumptions, energy codes, um, PL prototype, other research that is available. Um, but it's never going to be an exact prediction. So that's something that you need to understand as you incorporate analysis and how to explain caveats to your building clients, your other folks within your team. Um, of course, and those variables that I'm talking about are court, poor construction practices, um, extreme weather conditions, and also being unexpected use of space by occupants. Um, you know, some interesting little graphics there. Um, how do we set up a project in Cove Tool? So there's four uh, minimum requirements that we need to have. We need your building's location, your building typology, uh, the inputs that we will help us run all of the different um, simulations, and of course, the calculation methods. And the nice thing about Cove Tool is that we automate the calculation method and input standards. So with just very little information like location and geometry, um, as well as typology, we can automatically uh, set up all the analysis for energy, daylight, load sizing, um, et cetera. There's a lot of different types of simulations you can do. Um, here's a kind of wide array of all the different areas. Um, Cove Tools' mission is to be able to do all the simulations that can be conducted throughout the life of the project. But right now, we are targeted on the lowest hanging fruit that can be accomplished and the early stages in house. Um, this is another great graphic. This comes from the Architect's Guide to Building Performance. So it's an introductory guide on what analysis should be conducted, who's responsible for them. Um, and it showcases um, that, a lot, that architects can be responsible and more involved in a lot of these decisions that happen earlier on. And of course, at some point, you are going to hand off the model or the analysis to a building performance specialist or an engineer or anything like that. Um, but there's more that we can have an influence on earlier on. Um, yeah, so lots of graphics. Um, <laughs> and last thing I want to showcase is uh, some of the metrics that you want to measure. So typically for this presentation, I actually go through under explaining each of the different simulations, how they work, how you're supposed to use them. But uh, for today, we're just going to actually do a demo of the app. So let me pull up the tool. Cool. Um, so if you haven't checked out our website or platform before, um, you can do so at cove.tools. Um, you can also just type in covetool.com. Both of you take them to our platform. Um, you can learn a little bit more about what we do. Um, our tool is really designed for architects, engineers, owners, contractors. Um, so you can see how more it's segmented. We have a couple of different product lines. Um, but for today, I'm just going to be talking about the analysis features. Um, if you'd like to learn more about all the features that we have in the app, just go to product and features. And here you can see a list of the different tools, integrations, um, APIs, uh, resources that we have, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go ahead, hop into the dashboard. This is the first thing you'll see once you log into Cove Tool. Um, there's three uh, components of the projects page. Uh, you have, of course, your projects list. You can see all of your projects 
If you're an account admin, you can see everybody on your firm. Uh, with CoveTool, you can create templates and folder project folders. Um, if you don't know what a template is, these are pre-created projects that anybody on your team can reference as they set up their own projects. Um, so for example, once we start a new project, I'll show you that next. Um, we have eight base templates that you can begin with, um, but really you can model any type of typology uh, with any project scope, any scenario that uh, whenever somebody else on your team needs to create the same type of analysis, they can just click a template, like my fire station template, create a copy, upload their own geometry. And since we've already preloaded all the values, they won't have to do any other work. They just create a, uh, quickly create a report. Um, and of course, uh, folders as well as one of those things. Um, you can see different iterations and examples I have down here. I have uh, conference papers working on. Uh, master's studies, different projects we're involved in consulting in. Um, one nice thing you can do with projects is as you're making iterations and you want to put together a competitive report, you can do that. They have these little check boxes, click compare, and then you can do a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison report um, with some of the key metrics like energy consumption, utility costs, uh, daylight, um, lead points, and so on. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, uh, right before we go into the project, I just want to show you our resources. So CoveTool is probably best known for their support and resource center. So we do have live support. Um, so if you ever have a question, you need help troubleshooting your model, you don't understand results, you can always reach out to our support team. Um, they're architects, engineers, um, CoveTool experts, they'll answer your question within five minutes, um, and they uh, are active during working hours, so Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we also have a YouTube library with a lot of uh, video tutorials, troubleshooting videos, um, things of how to walk through the app and understand the different features, and a help center. Um, the Help Center has over 500 articles on everything you need to know about building science, modeling best practices, the different features. So if you heard me talk about carbon earlier and you have no clue what embodied carbon is, how to calculate it, how this affects your building, you can check out the article, see how, it, how it's explained, how it works, where these values come from, all that kind of stuff. So we try to be as much an educational platform as well as a design platform. So I'm gonna hop into CoveTool. Um, this is my demo model. I typically show this in webinars. Um, it's a office tower in San Francisco, California. Um, before we talk about setup, I just wanna show you a little uh, navigation. On the left-hand side, again, you have that navigation bar. Each one of these icons is a different tool or page in the app. You complete the first two and that preloads everything that you need to run simulations for 3D, facade, energy, water, climate, costs, and uh, mechanical systems. Um, down here, you also have your collaboration features. So this is where you invite folks. Um, you can chat with them. All that happens there. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much navigation. Um, so information you can upload for your project, image, name, number. Um, the minimum requirements, again, those are selecting a building typology, building location, energy code, and then on the next page, you'll upload geometry. And that's all we need to have so you can run any analysis within the app. Um, we have only eight base templates because these are the base templates that are standardized across all the codes um, and other standards that we follow. Um, but once you reach the energy page, you can always customize them to build whatever it is you're trying to model. Um, you can also create mixed-use buildings. So if you have retail, office, apartments building, each one has its own unique HVAC, uh, schedule, envelope properties. You can customize those or just stick to a single-use office. Um, for building location, you can use street address or geo coordinates, so latitude and longitude. This helps us kind of localize the project. So we'll get your cost information, carbon information for the region. We'll look at what energy code is currently adopted and also populate the 3D context model for your site. So we can do all the shadow and daylight studies. Um, energy codes are based on your location. So we'll just show you all the options that are currently available there. 
Um, in California, you only have Title 24, commercial and single family home. In other areas, you'll see all the ASHRAE options, IECC codes. If you're international, we also support those projects um, all in the tool. Next page, uh, this is the final requirement to set up a model. It's geometry. With CoveTool, you have three options for uploading geometry. You've got manual mode, 3D mode, and the drawing tool. Depending on what you already have readily available and what kind of information you're trying to generate, that determines which option you'll go with. So if you have a really tight turnaround or you're in a feasibility project, you don't have a model set up and you have a couple hours to put together a presentation, then you might just want to do a manual mode model, which is just man manually, area manually entering in area takeoffs of the roof, the floor, and the window to wall ratio. And that's enough to just create a shoebox model, get some basic uh, benchmark information, the climate report, and also a baseline energy model. If you do happen to have a 3D model, then you can use any of our plugins to upload geometry via third parties. So we have add-ins and plugins for Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, uh, Archicad, Vectorworks, et cetera. Um, you can check out the video tutorials and help articles to see how they work. Um, geometry import tends to be the biggest learning curve. And I'd say after your third import, you tend to understand what Colf is looking for and get comfortable with that process. And again, if you have any issues or obstacles, just reach out to our support team. Don't let anything linger for like more than an hour um, if you're not sure what's happening. Um, Back in the app, your last option is the drawing tool. So the drawing tool actually allows you to create geometry from scratch in the platform. So if you don't have a model, but you still want an analysis that includes all the different tools and features, then you can make it in our app. Um, and you have all your drawing tools up here. You got your primitive massing tools and then your more detailed um, geometry components. Um, we also have an assembly builder. So this is where we can start assigning the different products and layers in our building assemblies and then assigning that to our building geometry. And CovTool has probably the most integrated database for building products out there. So we automatically can calculate your thickness, the thermal performance, the embodied carbon, and also the construction costs for all of the assemblies in your project. Um, and these include costs, uh, the labor and equipment for your location as well. Um, yeah, uh, once you're happy with your geometry import, then you can go ahead and start jumping around the different analysis pages. The first analysis page is 3D analysis. So you'll have all your 3D tools. Um, you can see this is my context model. This is downtown San Francisco, close to the water by Chinatown. And um, this is our office tower imported by the Rhino plugin. Um, we can edit our context if we want. So if I want to move our building, rotate it, um, delete any of these context buildings. I can do all those changes. Once I'm happy with it, close editing mode, hit calculate, and then rerun all the analysis. Um, you got your shadow tool, which is where you can control time of day, day of the year, where shadow is being cast. If you're putting together presentation images, you can always take snapshots with this camera icon on the top right-hand corner, and then just post-process that post-process that or put it into a presentation, whatever you're trying to do. Uh, we have uh, envelope analysis. We got radiation and sun hours. See the intensity and duration of sunlight on the envelope. And of course, materiality and context is all being taken into account when we run those. You have two daylight metrics. So these are the daylight models, SDA and ASC. Um, we can look at the legend down here, anything in that blue cooler color range. Um, all those grid points are not receiving sufficient daylight, but the yellow, orange, red ones are. Um, so we can help redesign the facade strategy, the massing strategy, um, change materiality to figure out what's the best daylight strategy for the building. Um, you also have the glare ASC analysis um, to see if you have any issues with overexposure, visual discomfort, and you can do things like fins, overhangs, other facade strategies to mitigate glare. Um, I'll just kind of keep moving on, but if you see any analysis in the app you're not familiar with, there's these question mark icons. 
and they have hyperlinks to the help center. So again, you can go check out uh, what the explanation of that tool is, how it's calculated, how you should use it, example, reports, all that kind of stuff. All right, moving on. Uh, the next tool is the baseline energy page. So this is where all the energy modeling happens in Cove tool. At the top, you have your results. At the bottom, you have all of your inputs. And like I mentioned earlier, once you've given us your geometry and filled out that first page, all this is pre-populated. So by default, within five minutes, you can create a prescriptive baseline energy code minimum building. And then as you have more information about the project, you can go ahead and overwrite these values and answer in like, oh, we actually have a more efficient roof or uh, we don't have that HVAC system, we have something else. Um, and as you make those changes, you can hit recalculate and rerun the energy model in other 30 seconds. Um, one thing to note is that this baseline energy is not compliance level. Um, we have compliance level elsewhere in the tool. So we have an open studio export and also the load modeling tool can run energy plus. But what you see here on the baseline energy page is single zone and reduced order, which is why it requires so little inputs um, and also has just one input for the whole building. So we have one roof R value for the whole building, one wall R value. Um, and other parts of the tool, you can specify the strategies everywhere. But this is really going to save a lot of time. It can help you quickly iterate through different options, figure out what the um, impact will be of certain decisions. Um, and then when you're ready to run the final compliance level model, you should know that you're in the right um, location for that. So you can expect what kind of performance you'll get. Um, results also include your whole building EUI, that's energy use and cut intensity. That's how much energy per square foot per year you need to operate your building. Um, if you don't know whether that's a good or bad number or where you should be, we've got this fourth table called benchmarking energy. Um, we're using the 23rd challenge to benchmark your model. So we have this baseline. This baseline is the national average for a building of your size, typology, and location. And this 2030 target is what we would consider a high performance project with that same description. So um, where everyone else is, where you should be, and then also your EUI is your design below um, where you currently are. Um, we also calculate things like lead points, utility costs, and here's your operational carbon emissions. Um, later, you'll see the embodied carbon for material selection. Um, if you are reporting to the 2030 challenge or it's something that you would like to sign up your firm to do next year, um, Coltool can just help you do it with a click of a button. You've already run all the energy analysis. Now you just report that to the DDX and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of users go from you know, 10, 20, 30% reporting to 100% with uh, using Coltool. Um, so uh, at this point, you can create a report. So this is a little bit of the information you can package. Um, you'll see benchmarking overviews, summaries, snapshots of the tool, um, and also like the climate report, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's other tools, but I'm not gonna explain them since we're almost out of time, but there's the facade prototyping tool. Uh, there's a water calculator, the climate analysis. Um, every climate diagram comes with a help diagram. Um, because these tend to be indecipherable to most architects. So we try to explain what it is, how you should use it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the last uh, tool I'll talk about is our optimization feature. So earlier in the presentation, I was talking about like one thing the project, the conversation always comes down to is talking about costs. So with Cove Tools data, since we associate costs with almost every factor of the building, we can now start looking at multiple different alternatives and generate cost metrics for each of those options. So um, Covtool can estimate your baseline construction costs. We can look at cost premiums for alternative material options, payback years, energy savings, um, so on, as well as uh, embodied carbon. This is gonna be that product stage embodied carbon at lead points. Um, since we have a lot of folks who use Covtool also report to lead. Um, this tool can be pretty intimidating to uh, use and look at. So I'm going to explain it in three steps. 
uh, step one, you want to go through each of these product tabs. Um, each of these product tabs has uh, each of the product categories. These top grayed out ones you've already established earlier on on the energy page. This is your baseline. And then you can add alternatives, um, which are all of these other options. So I'm going to click the plus icon, add an alternative. I can look for um, something else in our material library that I want. Or if I want to create something custom, I'm going to create a custom BSUG wall. Give it a performance of R22. Give it a cost of you know, $15 per square foot. And then carbon. Um, of six uh, per square foot. Um, and then we can run that against all of the other alternatives that we have. Um, if you use one of our drop down options, that then we'll populate the performance costs and carbon for each product. But if you enter it in manually, it's all information that you have. So you want to add alternatives to everything that you want to look at. So here you can also do a system comparison. So just look at which HVAC options are really great. Um, different lighting options, equipment options, schedules, um, so on. Once you're happy with all those alternatives, you're going to hit recalculate, rerun the optimization tool. And when you rerun optimization, it's going to take about a minute or two to load, but it's going to run an energy model and cost optimization survey for every possible combination of those alternatives. So now we can do a holistic analysis and figure out what's going to be the best bundle of those options that helps us hit all of our project goals. So that's what all of these other bundles are in this list. Right now, we created 203 alternative options that can help improve our baseline model. And improving our baseline model means either we can do it at a lower cost, a lower energy, or if we do it for a higher cost, um, maybe that helps us do you know, other things. Um, it automatically removes anything that's too expensive or too energy inefficient um, as well. So if we look at this again, um, I'm going to look at the lowest cost bundle, actually. So right now, our baseline model is going to cost $18.9 million to build, have an energy baseline of 25 EUI. If I were to want to spend about half a million dollars less, um, which is selecting these alternative options, we can. Um, it's going to increase our EUI up to 30, but that's just one of the options we can make. Um, we can also invest an additional almost $4.7 million, and that will help cut our EY in half. And then you can see the payback period, which is when you make up um, in utility savings from what you initially invested, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, since we have over 200 bundles, it can be pretty overwhelming to look at each and every one of them. So the last thing you can do on optimization is filter using these parameters up here. So I'm just going to highlight things I care about. So payback period, I just want to talk about anything under 10 years. Um, EUI, let's look at anything under 25. Cost premium, they're all pretty good. Um, we're actually under like 1.5 million. Energy savings, anything above 40%. And then let's try to do these low carbon options. So with these parameters that we've added to the project, we can start seeing some of the top performing products that hit all of our targets. Um, and then also what bundles we need to select for the building. So now if we add, invest an additional $1.245 million, uh, we can reduce our energy from 25 to 21 EUI, five-year payback period, 40%, 45% energy savings. 710 body carbon CO2 tons. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit of how the optimization works. It's really great for short listing, like where you need to invest in certain areas of the building. Um, you don't always have to do an analysis based on costs. You can also just equate all the costs to like $1 and then look at R18, R20, R21, R22, and then just figure out what's the most efficient for your location for your building. A lot of flexibility and customization um, in optimization and elsewhere in the app. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I want to showcase today. Um, that's there's a lot more to Cove Tool, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what it is we're doing and some of the issues that we're trying to solve um, with Cove Tool.
I think I can open up the floor for questions now. Thanks, Marco. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, we should be able to just use this microphone here in the room. We've got a fairly technical audience here yeah. in Boise. Um, a lot of open studio users and the like. Um, I'll start with one question and then just yeah, open it up to others. But what, what does that workflow look like to go from this initial model for early design to um, you know something that uh, could be a, a use for lead or has more details on zones or um, different HVAC equipment rather than the defaults? Yeah, so it depends on your like comfort and skill level um, of what kind of tools you want to use and what subscription you get. Um, but one option you have is if you set up your building, um, the geometry profile with the drawing tool, um, the drawing tool, you can actually assign like different um, room templates and room templates we're kind of using as zones and other parts of the tool. So you can customize um, wall assemblies, room templates, all that stuff. And if you set up your geometry with the drawing tool, once you go to the baseline energy page, you have an open studio export over here. And this open studio export uh, will have the model as well as the open studio measures that will map all the information that we have in Cove tool down here and that you've set in the drawing tool um, into that platform. It's not gonna complete like 100% of the open studio model. It's about 50 to 60%. And you'll also see a pop-up window letting you know like what wasn't mapped. So you know what you have to complete in the tool. So open studio is really common. Um, if you do happen to use the load modeling feature, so this is the one of the tools I didn't really talk about, but in load modeling, um, this is where more of the mechanical engineers use if they are purchasing Coastal subscriptions. Um, you can actually do uh, uh, a lot of more detailed analysis. Right now, the load modeling tool does run on Energy Plus. Um, it doesn't have the hourly reporting though, so it's not yet compliance. It's something we're trying to do by January. Um, but you can export a building analysis model, which is gonna be a GBXML um, and also an SDDXL. So if you use ISVE um, or other tools that take GBXML, um, you can get that from the load modeling tool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's a question online. Uh, is the tool applicable to US market or can it be used in the context of the European market? Yeah, so um, our primary market is US, but we also have users in UK, Australia, Japan, and Canada. Those are the biggest international markets that we currently have like codes and standards populated in the platform for. Um, but it can be used anywhere in the world. We just uh, do a lot of climate zone mapping. So if you are designing a project in Germany and we currently don't have a German energy code, um, then we will just do a climate zone mapping to see what code we do have. And then we'll apply all of those standards to that area. So that's, that's just kind of how it works. And if uh, we have a lot of firms from Germany that want to start using Cove tool, then we'll you know, add everything we have to add for them to start using the platform. Cool. Other questions? How's the data for your labor for, for kind of the location? Is that updated often given the, you know, Varying costs across the country. Um, yeah. Where do you pull that from? Yeah, so it's updated about every six months. Um, Coltel does have a cost estimator and a VDC director um, who does the cost audit. Uh, we just recently updated it yesterday for the entire platform. So mm -hmm. if you were previously a Coltel user, you would have seen like an update letting you know that all those mm -hmm. values were changing. Um, but the sources for them are historical um, databases. So we take things like RS means and other like major publications of like labor data, equipment data, things like that to set our own cost baseline. Um, we also used to work with 
uh, manufacturers to get manufacturer cost data. Um, right now that's paused, um, but I think in a couple of months we'll start that again and you'll see more manufacturer available data. But you should see um, kind of that information explained um, in a help article. Yeah. That's great. It's a great tool. Thanks. Hey, Marco, could you uh, explain the uh, subscription costs? Like, is there um, a cost associated with running uh, models over and over again? Or is it just one base cost? Um, it's going to be one annual subscription. Um, so it's annual subscription. It's floating licenses. So it just depends on the number of license seats you purchase. That determines how many people can be on the platform concurrently. But you do have unlimited projects with your subscription. So you can do as many iterations, um, studies as you want. As long as you have the number of license seats you want, that, that really depends on your pricing. And also um, we do have like additional training. So if you wanna have like monthly, quarterly training or other things like that, then that also will affect your costs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How much flexibility do you have in HVAC inputs? Are they all package systems that you're picking from, templates? Um, so if you're using the baseline energy page, there's about 70 different HVAC systems and all of these are fixed. Uh, but if you're using the load modeling tool, um, you can customize the systems. We'll have like default templates and then from the templates, you can start making additional changes um, to those systems. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Marco, I'm wondering, um, now that we're getting into kind of 2030 reporting season, is the baseline within Cove Tool um, going to continue to update yearly, or is it going to stick with the 2003 CBEX to to maintain that baseline? So I think uh, I think everyone has agreed to stick to the 2003 CBEX baseline as the national average. Um, even though CBEX has published more recent updates, I think the 2003 one was the largest one ever conducted and had the most typologies. Um, so we'll just keep using that as the baseline. And we also connect directly to Zero Tool, which is the 2030 Challenges own benchmarking tool. So that's where we get benchmarking per typology. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little bit of how it works. I know we were getting some different um, readings from Zero Tool to Cope Tool to DDX last year with reporting in terms of baseline. So I was just checking in on that piece of it. Yeah, so um, when Zero Tool runs, it actually runs its own energy model in order to figure out like what your your proposed EUI will be, and that's how it calculates your percent reduction. Um, but Zero Tool's model is a lot more simplified, and it's based on like zip code, how it populates your standards. Ours is just a little bit more detailed, and if you make any changes, it also will like change what your proposed EUI versus baseline UI will be. So I, we definitely expect small differences um, to be there. And if we see major differences, it typically has to do with like climate zone um, stuff. But it's always something that we're happy to like look at. But I, I think we, I remember that coming up a few times and it was just because Zero Tools model was all or simpler than ours. And then another question, have you, with the new assembly builder tools for embodied carbon, have you compared that to like a tally analysis with life cycle assessment? And, and what did you find if you have? Um, so our carbon tools are currently not doing full LCAs. It's just product stage and use stage. Um, oh. And yeah, and uh, we do have a carbon embodied carbon tool that's going to be coming out in December, and that will be a lot more kind of apples to apples comparison that we can do. Um, but yeah, right now I think we're really happy with the the results. I think we were within ninety five percent of a structural engineer um, who was helping us do their 
at embodied carbon estimations for a building. So yeah, we're confident, but I don't have a LCA comparison right now. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any final questions before we wrap up? Okay, uh, thank you, Marco. Really appreciate your time and uh, explaining the tool. Yeah, no problem. Um, hopefully it was helpful. And if you guys have any other questions, always feel free to reach out to me or our team. Um, we're always happy to give you more information on the app. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See y'all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.